The Belgian Grand Prix is over and it was once again victory for Max Verstappen. But we did expect that as this was always going to be one of Red Bull's strongest tracks. But behind the Red Bull pair, we saw a very interesting race with a large variety of strategies. But the question is, what did we learn? Well, that is what we're going to be talking about as we do a data analysis from a hectic Belgian Grand Prix. Now let's get into the video. As usual, I'll be talking about McLaren, Ferrari, Aston Martin, Mercedes and Red Bull later on, so stick around for that. This year's Belgian Grand Prix was a race that featured a wide variety of strategies, plenty of overtakes and varying weather conditions, all of which challenge the drivers and teams. Due to the characteristics of the Belgian Grand Prix, because of the weather at Spa and also because of the circuit design, we saw a mixture of setups as some teams opted for higher downforce and some teams opted for lower downforce. The higher downforce was much better suited to the wet conditions that we saw at the beginning of qualifying and also during the brief rain stint during the race. However, overall it seems that low downforce was the far superior option, but the question is how much of a difference did we see between high downforce and low downforce? Well to show that, I have the fastest lap from Lando Norris in the McLaren and Logan Sargent in the Williams and what can we see? Please note that neither driver has use of DRS, but look at the top speed difference. Williams is a very low downforce car, whereas McLaren is opting for high downforce and high drag this weekend. This meant that we saw up to 30 km per hour difference between the two teams. With a much higher downforce, it meant that for McLaren it was almost impossible to overtake, especially when compared to the teams like Williams, who had very low downforce and had up to 30 kilometers per hour faster top speed. As I mentioned, we saw a variance of strategies as well as some teams opted to do one stop and the majority of teams opted to do two stops and we even saw one team commit to doing a three stop strategy and because of this, we saw a total of 37 pit stops and we never really saw the hard tires at all during the race apart from a brief stint by Lando Norris on the hards at the early stages. Lando, like I said, only did a short stint before changing back onto a set of soft tyres and going the rest of the race on those tyres. The softs were a great race tyre in this race and we saw many drivers switching off of the mediums onto softs between lap 22 and lap 28. But why was this? Well, this graph also by Pirelli shows that around lap 22, you can see that the asphalt temperature drastically drops. The reason for this drop is because the rain started to fall at this point, and for the teams being on the softest possible tyre became the all important strategy decision. Finally, the fastest lap of the race was set by Lewis Hamilton in the Mercedes right at the end of the race as he changed onto a fresh set of medium tyres and set a lap time of a 147.305. So, what midfield teams looked good and what teams did not look so good? Well, one team that did not have a great race was the Haas team as once again they were the slowest team overall during the race and they were by some distance one of the slowest teams as it seems like once again they struggled massively with degradation and how can we see that? Well, to find out, let's pull up the lap times of Sonoda in the Alpha Tauri and compare that to Hulkenberg in the Haas to see what we can learn. Rather early on, Hulkenberg actually has strong pace on the medium tyre versus that of Sonoda and we saw that he was actually able to make some decent progress through the field. At this point, all is looking well. Hulkenberg then changes onto the soft tyres and you can see that during the rain phase he is way faster than Sonoda who is still on medium tyres at this point. Then on lap 24 both drivers stop again for a set of soft tyres and this is where we see Haas in terms of pace fall off of a cliff. Initially things look well and you can see that he is way faster, however after lap 30 there is a turning point and Hulkenberg's pace massively slows down whereas Sonoda is fairly consistent and only slowly starts to fall off towards the end. This graph shows clearly the issues Haas are facing in terms of tyre wear as this is still something that they must fix during the second half of the year because they have very little race pace when compared to their rivals and if this continues it doesn't matter how well they do in qualifying. One midfield team that can be fairly happy with their race at Spa was the Alpine team. 
After a difficult weekend, which has seen team personnel leave and staff being moved around, they actually had a solid race with decent pace, as Esteban Ocon was able to score some much valuable points, as Alpine looked to lock themselves into P6 in the Constructors' Championship. His teammate Gasly just missed out on the points, but that was because Gasly was one of the drivers that opted to do a one-stop, meaning that he had to run the unfavoured medium tyres long into the race. Unfortunately, Gasly started on the soft tyres and had to switch onto the mediums during the rain spell, which meant that he was really on the wrong tyre at the wrong time, and you can see that he never really managed to recover, whereas Ocon was able to change onto the softs and was actually able to extract good performance from that Alpine car. The Alpine was actually one of the faster cars in a straight line, which really helped them when it came to overtaking. To show that, I have this lap from Ocon and this lap from Russell in the Mercedes, in which both drivers don't have DRS. Even though they don't have DRS, you can clearly see that Ocon was able to have a monster speed in a straight line, which worked nicely in Alpine's favour. For the Alpine team, whatever happens with whoever takes over from the team, they need to come together and actually have a sense of direction. Consistently chopping and changing personnel is never going to help them move forward and score more podiums, which is really what they need to try and be able to do at this point in their juncture. I just want to say that if you are enjoying the video, I'd greatly appreciate it if you hit the like button and subscribe for more F1 content. We're so close to 3k subs and I would greatly appreciate it if you help me get there. Now, let's get back to the video and let's talk about the top 5 teams and let's start with McLaren. For McLaren, the Belgian Grand Prix was not a great race. Sadly for Piastri, he was out at the beginning after an incident with Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari and for Lando Norris, there was a lack of overall pace from the Brit, at least when compared to what we've seen in the last few races. But why was this? The reason was that McLaren opted for a wet setup and compromised massively on the straight line performance. However, because of this, they actually really struggled for pace and were frankly sitting ducks in a straight line. Their overall pace was lacking and the only part of the race where they looked somewhat strong was during the early rain phase of the race. To show this, I have the graph of the race pace from Russell, Ocon and Norris as these three drivers all finish next to each other. And what can you see? Well, what you see is during the rain phase here, Norris actually has brilliant pace. However, as soon as the circuit starts to dry up and the rest of the competition change onto fresh soft tyres, you can see that the any advantage that the McLaren had is instantly wiped away again. We saw that during qualifying because when it was wet, McLaren were towards the top of the sheets, but as soon as it dried up, they fell backwards. For McLaren, they can head into the summer break overall very satisfied that they have a great car, even if the Belgian Grand Prix was a little bit disappointing. For Ferrari, the Belgian Grand Prix was a return to form in terms of overall pace, as the Spa circuit highlights where Ferrari is strong. The high-speed nature of the circuit suits their car nicely when they get the setup right, and we saw that they were rewarded with a podium for the Ferrari of Charles Leclerc. For Sainz though, it was a race to forget after an incident at Turn 1 with Oscar Piastri as that destroyed any chance he had for scoring points as he punched a hole in his side pod. When we compare the pace of Leclerc to Sainz, you can see just how much that hole in the side pod cost Carlos. The only reason I can think as to why Ferrari opted to keep Sainz out on circuit was to see if they could potentially gain something during the rain phase, but as soon as it became clear that the rain was not going to be significant, they retired the car. For Ferrari, overall, they can be happy with what seemed to be like a very good weekend, as they were the second fastest car. For Aston Martin, the race was an improvement after a tricky qualifying, and also over a difficult last couple of races. It seems like they managed to balance the compromise for setup nicely, which is where things went wrong for McLaren. Aston have been typically one of the slower cars in a straight line, but this was not the case this weekend, as you can see when we compare the pace of Alonso to Norris. From this, you can see that Alonso has significantly more pace during a lot of the race, and you can see that the stint on the hard tyres really did cost Lando in this race. When we look at the fastest lap trace from both drivers, you can see that the Aston had a speed edge over McLaren, and once again, neither driver has DRS, but yet Aston Martin have up to 10km per hour over McLaren this weekend. 
For Aston Martin going into the summer break, they can be a little bit disappointed that they have slipped back in terms of overall performance, but there is a chance for a good result next time out at Zandvoort. For Mercedes, the Belgian Grand Prix was an interesting race, as Russell was one of the few drivers who opted to do just the one stop. However, unlike Pierre Gasly, Russell was able to change onto the soft tyres instead of the mediums during the rain stint of the race, which worked perfectly for him as he was able to use the softs and get the most amount out of the tyres when grip was at a premium. For Hamilton, he was going back and forth with Leclerc in terms of pace all race long, as the two were fighting very hard, as you can see when we take a look at this graph. However, this weekend, Ferrari were just able to just about outpace Mercedes, although it did give Hamilton the opportunity to box and set the fastest lap of the race at the very end of the Grand Prix. And finally for Red Bull, it was another dominant display by Max Verstappen as he was simply in another league when compared to his teammate Sergio Perez and you can see that when we compare both drivers. Perez is only ever faster than Verstappen at the beginning of the race as Verstappen is fighting Hamilton and Leclerc. As soon as Verstappen is by both drivers, you can see he's able to lap consistently between 0.7 to 1.2 seconds per lap faster than Perez. It was another crushing victory for Verstappen and he is now only one Grand Prix away from matching Sebastian Vettel's all-time record for most consecutive victories by a single driver. So I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, as always, comment, leave a like and subscribe for more F1 content. Thank you all so much for watching.